Hello, and welcome to the webinar on how technology is reshaping the future of education. I'm your moderator, Christina Cardoza, Associate Editorial Director of Insight.Tech. And here to talk more about this topic, we have John Hewlin from Crestron and Joe Jackson from QSIS. So before we jump into the conversation, let's get to know our guests a bit more. John, I'll start with you. What can you tell us about Crestron and your role there? Well, thanks for having me first, Christina. Uh, it's great to be here. I have worked for Crestron for a little over 10 years. In um, uh, my first role for nearly eight years was working with colleges, universities, even some K through 12 districts uh, in the Midwestern United States. And my current role is now um, on the messaging side for our whole education vertical, which includes the United States, Canada, and then globally. So we have a team that works directly with colleges, universities, and schools to help them understand and uh, in implement Crestron technology. Great. Well, I can't wait to hear more about that. But Joe, I'll turn it over to you now. Welcome to the webinar. Hey, I'm Joe Jackson. Um, I'm the Senior Manager for Education and Government Markets for the QSIS Division of QSC. Um, I've been here about four years, but I've been in the industry a little over two decades. And I started out at uh, Southern Methodist University as a manager of technology and implemented all of this stuff. So it was only a natural progression that I would uh, go to a manufacturer and uh, help the rest of the education environment. So uh, good to be here and thank you for having us today. Of course, you both have some very strong backgrounds to help us navigate through this topic today. So before we jump into the conversation, let's take a quick look at our agenda. Today, we're gonna to talk about the state of education, how technology is playing a larger role, the benefits of EdTech for both teachers and students, different use cases you may not have expected EdTech to be applied to, as well as what we can expect from all of this in the future. So let's get started. Here at Insight.Tech, we've seen over the last few years, the Education Center has massively transformed and they've been under immense pressure to transform in order to adopt new technologies that support hybrid and remote learning. And these changes are bringing challenges, but also new opportunities in the way we teach and learn. So John, I'd love to kick off this topic with you, looking at where we are today, how those changes have impacted the educational landscape. Well, that's a huge question. You know, uh, the, the I would say that the the ins, uh, instructional technology landscape has changed dramatically over the last few years. Uh, you know, whether it's um, when you go back a little ways, proliferation of personal devices, laptops, tablets, phones, everybody's got them and carried them around. But then some even newer, uh, some newer teaching methodologies like the active learning spaces and flipped classrooms, the idea that you hear the lecture ahead of time, and then it get in groups when you're in class and go through the material. And then, um, you know, online education and remote learning, it was was starting to emerge pre uh, COVID and the pandemic. But then, you know, COVID happened. And to me, that was really an incredible catalyst to push these technologies forward. So I, I'm not saying really uh, everything started with COVID. The truth is it was way before that, but um, it really acted as a COVID, uh, excuse me, as a catalyst for that. And so we're, we're looking at things now like hybrid learning, like um, blended learning and, and high flex learning. And you know, if you want, we can go into those types a little bit, but all kinds of new uh, learning methods that the technology is required uh, to have implemented and implemented well. Absolutely, and I agree. This all was happening before COVID, but COVID sort of forced everyone to adopt these technologies very quickly. And now that we had a chance to sit back and see how they've been working, we can be a little bit more thoughtful and purposeful about how we use these technologies. And you've mentioned a couple of them at the beginning, um, laptops, tablets, so Joe, I'm wondering if you can expand on the type of technology we're seeing in the classroom today and how that's improving education. Sure, yeah, I, I just kind of want to expand on what John was saying about, you know, how COVID kind of sped things up a bit, right? I mean, Zoom's been around for the better part of a decade. I remember installing it on my laptop when I was doing a bunch of H323 stuff, a lot of distance learning with appliances and, and purpose-built things just for that, um, that specific um, discipline, but now it's ubiquitous. Now you have cameras in the classroom. Now you have the ability to monitor things like a true IT focused business would. You can monitor these things and then 
um, you can offer it to communities that have never, um, maybe I can't get to a campus, maybe um, I don't have the resources, but I have an internet connection and I have a laptop and now I can take classes online. Um, so I think it's really broadened our approach to education now and become more inclusive, to be honest with you. Um, ed tech is always going to push the envelope. I love giving technicians the ability to do crazy things with our stuff. They find building controls is one of those things that I think we'll get into later, maybe. Um, but the, the idea of ed tech being something that's um, ubiquitous is really, really cool and really um, why I love being in this industry. It's, it's quite awesome to see us and um, push the envelope and see where we can go next. So it's been uh, quite a few years since I've actually been in the classroom myself. I remember um, growing up and learning in school, you know, we would have the projector come in and that would be, you know, projected onto a whiteboard or we would have a TV rolled in for movie day. And, um, you know, it, it took some time for the teachers to set this up and get it working properly. So I'm wondering what the state of adoption has been and how, um, you know, schools and teachers and students are getting acclimated with this new technology. John, I'll turn that one over to you. You know, it's it's been an incredible, you know, transition and, and um, implementation of new technologies, what we've seen recently. But I will say, we see a whole spectrum. You know, we see schools that uh, use t educational technology still quite on a limited basis. Maybe they just use it to put their, you know, projector in the classroom, like you said, PCs, laptops, you know, uh, tablets get plugged in, document cameras, and just use to help um, with visual aids, so to speak, for the course material. As an example, some of the colleges and universities uh, that we've seen are really implementing technology to, to push the cutting edge. You know, there's a school in Ohio that uh, uses virtual and augmented reality in their medical school. Uh, there's a technical school in Pennsylvania that is using uh, both Crestron and Intel's technology in their robotics. Uh, we've seen an R1 university, a, a top level research university in Southern California, use our virtual control uh, to be able to touch systems all around the campus. So, you know, it, it still varies whether the school is, is really implementing the technology or they're kind of waiting to see what, what happens. Absolutely. And some of those advanced technologies you mentioned, augmented reality, virtual reality, and even when it comes down to, to the laptops you bring at home, sometimes the students are figuring out how to work on their own or the teachers are on their own. So they're not necessarily in the classroom learning all of this stuff. So Joe, I'm wondering what sort of support or training is available when schools adopt this technology and how you get you know the staff and the students up to speed on it. Well, we have a wonderful online training course as well as in person. So when someone's investing heavily in the QSIS ecosystem, we actually invest heavily in them and we will bring training on campus. I find that an in-person training is probably better to do at least once, twice a year with folks, just so you can familiarize yourself with the on-campus tech, because there's only so much you can see on a video. However, the continuing education part of it you know, we've developed three and four hour blocks so someone could log in on a Friday, let's say. And if I'm your boss, I'm saying that's part of your job. Once a week, twice a week, maybe sit there and log in and learn something new. Um, it's also fun. Um, we have some really cool trainers. And when we go out in person, some people scoff at that and they're like, hey, where's Nate and Patrick? <laughs> I know they make it fun, but um, there are a lot more smart people at our company as well, just other than uh, the stars, Nate and Patrick, but they do a wonderful job of delivery. Um, and we also have a student, um, actually one of my technicians that I hired out of a school that's local to me, he's going back in um, on Halloween and he's going to teach a three hour course for an instructor that has a sound uh, technician course. And one of the things that came up was QSIS. So we're diving in and doing instruction at the universities themselves. So um, the online stuff is really cool. People love videos. If you just want to learn how to install a camera, it takes three minutes, watch a video. But if you really want to get deep, you want to go into UI creation, you want to go into uh, coding in Lua, we have that as well. And we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions with some of our top tier clients just to get them familiar with our product. So uh, training is multifaceted, you know, it's out there and just contact us and we'll help you. And we touched a little bit on, um, you know, the aspect of 
bringing educational resources to areas that you may not be in, um, having more access to resources and experts around the world, and even in some areas where you know the education um, landscape doesn't reach all of those transformations, they're now being able to benefit a lot more getting access to all of these different tools. So, um, you know, I, I want to look at the benefits of ed tech, both from a student and teacher perspective. John, um, if you want to take that one. Absolutely. You know, I think from the student's perspective, what we're really talking about is different ways of learning and really ingesting material to, to commit it to memory. So, you know, there are students that, uh, in like me, that I'm a visual learner. So, you know, the technology really helps reinforce that, that, um, desire and preference of mine, you know, to, to learn um, through visual material. But the truth is uh, audio amplification being implemented, you know, as well, it, it can do everything for, for benefit students from hearing, uh, better hearing a soft spoken, per, you know, professor or instructor to going back to listen to the material to, because they're a little bit more auditory, you know, and then they want to learn um, through hearing the, the information several times in a row. So now you have education technology that's, that's recording sessions and uh, audio amplification, as well as even active learning. So we're seeing technology implemented when um, students help teach other students the, the course material, they get back together in the classroom, use the education technology to collaborate and to really understand what the material is. That's kind of on the student side. On the instructor side, we've seen, especially with the, the COVID you know, uh, lockdowns, we've seen um, instructors go, you know what? I can teach a lot of my course material from home or remotely, or I can record portions of it ahead of time and let the students watch that maybe asynchronously, like not when the class is going on. So we've uh, seen the benefits to the instructors, everything from bad weather, you know, a snow day that says, hey, let's not just close school down, let's just make it an online learning day. To, um, to the benefits of bringing guest speakers in. So you have, you know, a, a medical school that wants to bring in a Chinese, you know, uh, doctor, an expert on a certain field, or you have a, a business school that wants to hear from a leader of a company in Europe to understand their privacy issues versus uh, what uh, maybe are the regulations are in the US. So there are incredible benefits to implementing this technology. It also takes an aspect from the school and from the instructors to implement the technology in their pedagogy, in their material, so they really integrate and, and get the benefits out of uh, implementing. So it's not just implementing technology for the sake of it, it's implementing technology to get those extra benefits. One thing that I really love that you said is, um, you know, being able to allow students to rewatch the, the lessons or to learn on their own time in their own speed. Education for a very long time has been, you know, teaching one way to all students, but not all students are the same. So this is really giving teachers and students the opportunity to learn and teach in a way that is most beneficial for them. And one thing I wanna to touch on though, is that there are still a lot of inequalities in the education landscape. Um, you know, I touched a little bit on them earlier about how not all areas around the globe have access to all of the educational resources that other areas have. So Joe, I'm wondering if you can talk about some of those inequalities and how the use of ed tech is tackling those. I mean, yeah, I think I touched on it before about, you know, folks that may be um, for a lack of a better term, out in the boonies. Um, not, they don't have access to a large city campus or a community school. Um, it is ubiquitous. It's on your phone. It's on your laptop. It's on your iPad. So if you have access to one of those or if you have a friend that has one of those, um, even for continuing studies, you know, folks that are already out in the world, but I still want to go back and learn basket weaving. Um, you can do that too. You can, well, you maybe not be able to do basket weaving on video, but bad example right um but um the, the pedagogy itself has just changed everyone has changed the way that they see the classroom now um, i remember back in the day i couldn't put cameras in the classroom i was at a private school and no one would allow cameras in the school i just wanted to watch the doors and make sure my equipment didn't walk off um, now the cameras are in the classroom they're front and back they're facing everyone um, we have microphones in the classroom 
And those people can now project themselves out to the boonies if they want. So the inequalities are kind of shrinking. And I think that what you're going to see, even though Harvard has a historic low 3.17 percentage entrance rate, there are a lot of other schools out there. There's 5,500 schools. SNHU online is a big one. Um, Phoenix online started it all, right? Um, anyone can get a hold of the information. I think what you're seeing mostly when the education is your freshman and sophomore year, you want to be on campus. After that, you know, yeah, juniors and seniors still want to be on campus to go to the football game, but most people just have busy lives now and education is for all of us. It's not just for the select few. Um, so that's what I would say. That's just, we're kind of going into that realm of education for all. And, and it says so on your slide. It really is for all. Well, you may not be able to do basket weaving online, but I've always wanted to learn to knit. So it's sounding more like I have no more excuses anymore. I can learn to knit from the comfort of my own home with on-demand access. So that may be something I have to look Elon into. Musk has neural link. You're going to be like Neo and just download <laughs> judo one day. So when Crestronicusis comes out with the WAP that can be implanted, watch out. Because I always tell people, if you get an RJ45 to your cat, I can control it too. But now it's a WAP. <laughs> You don't want wires. Well, it's amazing to, to hear where this technology can go and everything it's doing right now. One thing that I've noticed is, you know, in the past, technology companies um, and organizations have really competed against one another. But in this new modern world, you know, better together is an ongoing theme to get these all implemented, to be able to do this and benefit the schools, the teachers, the students. It's really a collaborative effort. And I know, John, you mentioned Intel. Um, I should mention insight.tech is um, an Intel owned publication, but we always love to hear how companies are not only working with just Intel, but other partners in the ecosystem to make this happen. Um, so if you guys could expand on the partnerships you have ongoing right now with Intel or anyone else you wanna mention, um, Joe, I'll start with you on this one. Sure, yeah, I mean, we're Intel inside. It's a, you know, I tell people this all the time. I, I love the term AVIT, but it's so dated. It's just IT and our DSP is just a DSP, right? But we are so much more. It's a processor that uses an Intel chipset based on a militarized version of Linux for the timing. And we just stack everything else on top of that. So Linux is very important to us. Uh, layer three, Intel products, COTS, you're gonna hear that a lot, commercial off the shelf appliances. Um, the virtual world is opening up. And I really do believe that software is eating the world. Um, we're a software company. QSIS is a software platform. And we, we need people to understand that our platform is ubiquitous to anything that's layer three and open API. We love our partners. We love um, all of our manufacturers. Because as you know, when you go into any you know, classroom out there, if it's dated a bit, you're going to have seven manufacturers in there. Um, some of them will have three. Others will have 20. So if you're not interoperable, and if you're not going towards that smart AV platform that we're kind of pushing, um, you know, you're kind of, you're, you're, you're in the stone ages. So move forward, uh, embrace software. Um, and that, that's kind of where I'll leave that part. And for, well, and for us, you know, for the last three years, I think uh, Crestron's been uh, the MRS gold partner, you know, of, of Intel's, which uh, market ready solutions partner of Intel. So, you know, we have used Intel uh, processing and, and technology in our uh, UC solutions, uh, our unified communication solutions and collaboration. Um, you know, Intel awards this gold partner status to people who, who implement the technology in um, other ways too, like, so our cameras, uh, the One Beyond camera hardware uses Intel as well as a, a, our, um, our AV over IP solution uh, uses Intel processing. And um, there's a, a specific product called the D80, which uses the Intel open uh, processing solution or excuse me, open platform solution. So that uh, actually it makes, it's a, it's a device that slides right into a display, making the, the display an endpoint for audio, video and control over IP. So there's a, a ton of different ways we partner with Intel and it's um, been incredible, especially over the last three to five years where uh, this technology is, is proliferating everywhere. Absolutely. And now that we've learned about some of the benefits and the technologies 
that go into all of this. I'd love to hear more, um, you know, about some of the examples that you guys already provided. I know I recently was reading an article on Insight.Tech and, you know, one of the, the courses this university in China was trying to teach was an intro to the Olympics. And so it was an online virtual course, but they brought the classroom to, you know, the outside or to the ice rink and had Olympic professionals teaching the course from, you know, the ice floor. So I'm very interested to see how else, you know, this is transforming the teaching plans and landscape and, you know, where else even beyond education, we can take some of these technologies and transform them even further. Um, John, I'll start with you on that one. Sure. You know, I guess there's too many to name right now. Uh, initially, I guess I would say we have uh, uh, dozens of case studies on our website about, um, and you can actually sort just by education. And so it's all about different institutions implementing Crestron technology all over campus. Um, you know, I, I, a couple of quick examples to give is we're about to, uh, I think I can say this, we're about to publish a video case study on um, University of North Carolina at Greensboro, their brand new esports um, facility. And, and that has become a huge uh, and important um, uh, type of, of learning and, and, and playing in, in college and universities and uh, uh, schools around the, the world now. Um, as well as University of Michigan and Ford uh, collaborated on an engineering building. And what's so compelling about that is I think the top two floors are for uh, Ford and run by Ford, and they're doing AI research and development and self-driving technology. And the bottom two floors are robotics, and the University of Michigan grad students are learning about um, developing robotics and, and programming for them and so on. Uh, so whether it's from um, examples like uh, medical schools in VR labs or mixed media labs, we have a, a university in Connecticut that has, um, they started with their esports program, but that ended up driving funding, both federal and private funding to fund a new cybersecurity range as well as a mobile STEM lab. That is a, a case study you can find on our website about Central Connecticut State University. There are um, really just so many compelling new uh, learning environments. And now we call them learning spaces, not even classrooms. And, and so, um, and actually one other uh, item that you'd find there is an article I wrote about AV everywhere on campus. Just the idea that, that uh, the this technology, how in it's Intel's implemented into Crestron solutions, but it's no longer just the classroom. You have huddle spaces and meeting rooms and um, shoot, you have uh, athlete study rooms uh, now in the athletic facilities and divisible rooms in the event centers, which are revenue generating spaces. So, I mean, th hopefully that's a, a more than you needed of examples, but uh, we have a lot of case studies on it. I love all the the esports stuff. I can't wait till it becomes a little bit more mainstream. My children are young. Uh, my oldest is only in kindergarten right now, but someone at the bus stop asked me the other day what sports I was planning on putting him in, and esport was my answer. Um, so really waiting, hoping that comes uh, soon to to my school. Joe, are there any other customer or real world examples you can share with us? Um, you know, and how the opportunities exist beyond the classroom. Yeah, I mean, near and dear to my heart is esports, and I've seen a lot of esports arenas pop up around, you know, the last decade or so. I tried to put one at SMU years ago, and they said, "What you doing? What?" And I'm like, "Well, there are more people that watch the video games online and watch the Super Bowl sometimes." So, uh, you know, Fortnite had a concert in the park, and 10 million people showed up. So, um, esports is really near and dear to my heart, especially as a company. You know, we have a cinema division. Everyone knows this in the AMC theaters and Atmos and um, those types of things, but we have partnerships with Epic Games, NC State that is, houses Epic Games um, program there. Um, we work with Netflix. We work with a ton of folks that have that immersive audio sound because most people know QSIS or excuse me, QSE um, as an audio company, um, but we're so much more than that. Um, the, the other thing that, you know, I want to touch on too is, and, and esports is great. I love it. Um, you, my, my son is into it. I'm into it. Uh, I'm trying to build an Atmos theater upstairs um, just so I can take the headphones off and get into the game. So uh, when you talk about gaming, I, I, I really 
you know, kind of tend to go uh, the creative route when it talks, when I talk about gaming, but um, building controls, like I said earlier, I mean, there, there's so many different things that our processors can be used for. Um, we had a client that uh, had someone kept leaving a freezer door open. So they put a sensor on it and they had reflect, tell them, Hey, go close the freezer door. Um, companies like Johnson control are building things like open blue platform, like digital twins. Um, the military is using AI and again, that immersive feeling of being in a video game to train their soldiers. Um, so there's so much more that this platform can do. And again, I tried to tell people, you know, AVIT really is a cool term, but it really is just IT and we are the AV geeks. So, um, I hope we continue to, to push the envelope into what's possible and universities and government is just my favorite because they do tend to um to like to push the envelope a bit so you'll have to you'll have to invite us over um for a land party once your atmos theater is all complete i have a gig internet connection and <laughs> as a kid trust me that was i remember the land parties and somebody had one meg <laughs> playing doom so so um you know we we covered a lot in this webinar um and i i want to look towards the future a little bit if you guys can look into your crystal balls and um you know any predictions you have on how these new technologies are going to continue to expand and bring us new use cases in the future and how also they are preparing our students for the future john you want to take that one first sure uh you know, there there are so many ways. I mean, we, we named a lot already, but I, I guess I'll start with this more fundamental truth that 21st century students are not expecting the same experience that their their parents had. And, you know, we um, I heard someone say the other day, which I really liked, and it was it was in an educational conference and they said we are digital natives trying to, excuse me, we're digital immigrants trying to teach digital natives with analog tools. And I was like, oh, that's perfect. You know, it's, it really is a, a big hill for us to climb uh, to, to understand the perspective of these students. I thought Joe brought up a great point that reminded me earlier when he said, you know, students sometimes want to be in the classroom, sometimes they don't. What, what I've noticed, I have a 15 year old and a 12 year old, and I've noticed that they, their idea of social is being connected through the game, for instance, or being online together, they almost consider the same as being in the same room. Or when classes have start, started back after some of the lockdowns, they were more interested in the social aspect and being together than they really were uh, necessarily being in the classroom. What you'll end up seeing is students watching the class material together, maybe in a shared student, um, you know, recreation area or a student learning space rather than necessarily going, but that's what they consider social. So I feel like uh, beyond the classroom is, is just that. Um, it is everywhere else learning needs to take place. I think of students who have dependents of their own at home and being able to still get that high school or college degree they've been craving to be maybe a first generation graduate or um, to expand their, um, their knowledge and capabilities. I mean, now we're talking about micro certifications for jobs and nano certifications where you're learning on the job constantly. And that's an expectation from employers. So beyond the classroom is just about every aspect of our lives. I definitely see that at home with my own kids and, um, you know, they're learning. We have various tablets where it's teaching them how to read through all of these interactive games, teaching them how to trace. And then even with some of the older technologies we have at home, they're very confused by it. They go to my laptop screen and they start pressing it, not expect, expecting things to work. And then they go in the classroom and they sit there at the chalkboard um, and they have no idea what they're looking at or what this is. So I think I absolutely agree in the future, you know, they're going to be using these technologies for work, for play. So why not bring it into the classroom? Joe, is there anything you want to add about how these new technologies are providing new opportunities for the future and for the students of the future? Absolutely. I think the future of education really should be based around user experience. And what I mean by that is we as manufacturers have to look through to who is the end user. 
well, is that the technician that installs it and maintains it? Is that the professor that delivers the information on the media? Or is that the person that is actually sitting there absorbing the information? I argue it's all three and four. And there are so many aspects that you have to get right. A break fix team now is implemented in most of the larger schools. Um, some of the smaller schools still have to rely on integration partners, but more and more what I see the future of education is a lot more educators taking more control over how they deliver that education experience. And it really is all about the user experience. And again, ubiquitous, learn from anywhere. You're on vacation and you want to learn how to scuba dive. You could probably watch a video. I was taught by a couple of crazy Australians on the way out to the reef. I don't suggest you learn that quickly and get thrown into the pool. But if you wanted to, you could. If you're that type of learner, we have to understand how do people learn? Do you need to be in class? Then let's come to class. But now we have the ability to split that class in half based on the, the needs of the user. So if the user can learn through video and flip the classroom and then come to school for instruction, then let the person learn that way. We, we can't pigeonhole folks into the same type of user experience. So I would say we just, you know, as manufacturers, what we need to do is um, the main thing that we do, I think, as, as a company is we go listen to the end users. And that means all of the stakeholders, not just the students, because it is about the students, but it's also about the delivery and the maintenance and the break fix of the technology. So we have to keep that in mind as manufacturers to keep pushing the envelope and making things a little bit easier for people to do, because it is technology. And that's what we have technology for is to make things easier, not harder. Absolutely. And I have to admit, I'm a little jealous about all of these technologies um, and tools that my kids are going to be able to, to grow up with. But as we discussed throughout this entire conversation, anybody can be a student now from anywhere in any topic. So um, I'm excited to dig into some more learning myself over the next couple of years. Unfortunately, we are running out of time today, and I'm sure we can continue to talk about this, you know, for, for hours, but before we go, are there any final key thoughts or takeaways you want to leave our attendees with today? Um, Joe, we'll start with you. Uh, just keep learning, folks. That's why we're here. I'm passionate about bringing technology to folks, not only for learning, but for the listening and for the visuals. And um, yeah, reach out to me or my team if you guys have any questions about our technology. and. Um, yeah, great talking with you guys. Absolutely. And John, any last uh, remarks? Yeah, you know, I, I feel like we, the, the technology allows the students to be prepared in so many different ways. And, and, you know, I think my biggest hope and passion and dream is that the AV departments, the audiovisual departments that used to be relegated to the basements, and some still are, and, you know, as a, as a retrofit, even on a new project, that they're elevated to the point where they get a seat at the table in design and the UX, the user experience, like Joe was mentioning, um, this it's technology has gone from being a roll a card into a room to integrated into um, both the network, the IT side, as well as the architectural side and, and even building and lighting control. There's so much. So I really hope that um, if there's there's C-levels, there's deans or provosts that, that listen to the, the, the webinar today, that they um, take a second to think about what consideration should I have when the school architect's thinking about a brand new business building or a medical building or a brand new um, classroom or learning space or a lab and get those designers who care about that user experience at the forefront and at a seat at the table? Great. Well, with that, I just want to thank you both for joining the webinar today. It's been a very insightful conversation and we'll have to be sure to, to follow back up and follow you guys as this landscape continues to evolve and see all the great things and the great works that Crestron and QSC continues to do. I also want to thank our audience for listening today. If you'd like to learn more about the future of education and ed tech, I invite you all to visit insight.tech where we have a wealth of podcasts and articles on the subject, as well as Crestron and uh, QSC. Until next time, I'm Christina Cardoza with insight.tech.